Welcome. Uh, this uh, presentation will be related to the facial depiction and reconstruction of Takabuti, produced by FaceLab at Liverpool John Moores University. My name is Professor Caroline Wilkinson and I'm the director of FaceLab and the majority of this reconstruction depiction was produced by uh, Dr Shrimpton who will be speaking uh, the majority of this presentation. So FaceLab is involved in a number of bits of research related to faces and identity. Our research includes facial reconstruction, facial recognition, identification of the dead, CGI and facial animation. We look at the ethical issues relating to the depiction of faces of the dead and we're involved in research relating to cognitive bias and its effects on facial depiction, specifically in relation to archaeological investigation. We have collaborations within this research across a wide range of fields from psychology through anatomy and art and design. And most of the work that we do is related to forensic investigation and archaeological investigation. Uh, in relation to Takabuti, of course, that's um, archaeological investigation relating to ancient Egyptians. The facial reconstruction process is carried out in our 3D virtual computer system. We have what's called a haptic arm, which allows us to feel what we're touching in the 3D computer screen. And we can bring in the 3D scan models of ancient remains, or forensic investigations into the computer system. And there we can add tissue depth pegs related to the sex, age and ancestry of the individual. And then we import pre-modeled muscles that represent all of the facial musculature and alter that to fit each particular skull. That allows us to build up from the surface of the skull through the muscle structure to the surface of the face. And we use um, anatomical standards to help us to predict different facial features. You can see on screen this is the computer system in progress and um, this was developed at the University of Manchester through a Nesta fellowship um, in, from 2000 and then was further developed at the University of Dundee and finally at Liverpool John Moores University within FaceLab. The anatomical standards that we use help us to predict facial features by assessment of skeletal structure. So we look at the orbits to tell us about the position of the eyeball and the shape of the eyelids and the position of the outer and inner corners of the eye. We look at the teeth to tell us about the width of the mouth and the thickness of the lips and how the lips meet. We look at the nasal aperture to tell us about the overall shape of the nose and the shape of the nasal spine at the base of the, of the nasal aperture in relation to the tilt of the columella, the base of the nose, to tell us about the overall pattern of nasal shape. The area we know least about is the, are the ears. We can tell whether someone has earlobes or adherent ears. You see a lobe there on the left and a adherent ear on the right because of the position and direction of a bony lump on the base of the skull called a mastoid process. But other than that, we don't know very much about ears. We know where they sit because of the position of the external auditorium meatus or the, the ear hole. Um, and roughly the size of your ear is similar to the height of your nose, but the detail of the ear is, is largely unknown. And we tend to use average modeled ears to help us with the facial depiction. So you can see here the gradual build up from the surface of the skull through the tissue depth pegs and facial musculature. And finally, the development of the facial features over which the skin layer and fat layer is added to produce the finished face. So the most frequently asked question to us is in relation to the accuracy of the facial reconstruction. And you can see here, we've been able to look at and evaluate the accuracy through the use of CT data from living individuals. So we've been able to have access to computer tomography from, a, from someone who's alive. We can reproduce a facial reconstruction based on their skull. 
and then we can, com can compare that directly with the surface of their face. And that's what you can see here in this experiment. You can see the uh, facial reconstruction on the right hand side there at the top and underneath the actual face of the individual. And then on the left hand side here, you can see a comparison of the two surfaces. And any area that is blue is the area of least error. And anywhere that is red or orange is the area of most error. And you can see here on the side of the head, this uh, indentation that's caused by the head injury as to why this person had the computer tomography scan in the first place. And we've carried out this kind of evaluation a number of times. And what we found is that about 70% of the surface of the facial reconstruction has less than two millimetres of error when compared to the actual face of the individual. And that allows us to be relatively confident in our ability to, to predict shape from skeletal assessment. Our problem really is anything that happens from shape onwards. So you can see here two images of the shape of the face as reconstructed from the skull. And this is just in the colour that we use, the particular clay within the computer system. But it's possible to add very realistic texture maps, surfaces that we can wrap around this 3D shape to make the 3D model look as accurate as possible and as realistic as possible. We can add skin colours, we can add eye colours, we can add hair, we can have details like moles or scars or, or wrinkles. We can make the 3D head look as realistic as possible using CGI techniques and potentially animation. The problem for us really is that anything from shape onwards cannot be determined from the skull. Uh, unless some sort of DNA analysis is carried out. And most of the time we don't know anything about skin colour, eye colour, hair colour and all those additional texture details that I've already mentioned. So this creates a bit of a problem for us when we're reconstructing and depicting faces, especially in forensic investigation, when we want them to be as accurate and recognisable as possible. Most of the time within forensic investigation, we produce depictions that look like this. They're black and white. Uh, we tend to focus on the centre of the face where we have the most accuracy and blur external details like hairstyle um, or hair at all. We found that if you don't put hair on, people think you're suggesting the individual was bald, which can also create confusion. Uh, so with men, we tend to chop the top of the head off in the image because we know that doesn't make any a uh, difference to recognition levels, but means we don't have to estimate whether the person went bald or not. Within archaeological investigation, there is more artistic license. We're trying to produce the most likely appearance of somebody rather than a recognisable likeness. But often now we're unsure about things like skin colour and eye colour and hair colour which means that we're relying more and more on the use of black and white images so that we're not predicting information that may not be accurate. OK, so uh, for the facial reconstruction of Takabuti, we were actually approached initially back in 2008 by the research team um, and we were asked to produce a facial reconstruction of what she might have looked like in life. We were provided with uh, CT data from which we were able to create two 3D models. So the first model on the left hand side is a 3D model of the surface of her face. And the image or the, the second 3D model on the right hand side is of the underlying skull. So we had two 3D models from which to work from. The model of the skull was used for the facial reconstruction process primarily. Um, but we did also use a little bit of information from the, um, the image on the left. So, for example, there's a little bit of detail around the nose and around the ear that helped inform us um, when we were reconstructing the shape of her features. Yeah. We used um, the digital sculpting software Freeform that uh, Caroline described earlier, uh, into which we could import the 3D model of the skull to begin the facial reconstruction process. We added average tissue depth thicknesses. In this case, uh, we used contemporary Egyptian population data. 
to help us with um, as a guide as to how thick the, the tissues are in those places. However, we also use information from the skull. So where a muscle attaches to the skull, it leaves a mark. Now, the stronger the mark, the more likely it is that the muscle was a little bit more robust and perhaps larger. So we're able to use that information as well to help us um, to estimate the thicknesses. Here we have all of the muscles um, added to uh, the skull of Takabuti, and they have been repositioned and resized according to the marks um, on the skull that are available to us and, and also the shape um, and size. From that, uh, we were then able to combine all those elements to um, form the contour layer of the facial reconstruction. So this is kind of the external um, parts of the face um, and they're kind of grown outwards and then smoothed over to give us this finished um, the contour shape. Then once that's completed, we move on to um, feature estimation. So I've just got um, a video here of the um, facial reconstruction of Tack Beauty inside the Freeform software. Um, that little orange ball that you can see moving around is just the tool that I'm using to be able to tug and pull at the reconstructed shape that I'm working on. Um, so you can just see me kind of manipulating that, that very slightly. There are lots more tools in Freeform that we use for this process. And um, in terms of the uh, prediction of facial features for Takabuti. For her nose, she had quite a soft, um, rounded shape um, that was ever so slightly upturned, so it, it dipped up slightly. Um, as Caroline mentioned earlier, we use the nasal aperture or the big hole in the skull that you can see and the nasal bones and the nasal spine, which is this bony protrusion at the base of your nose here, to help us to predict the shape of the nose. You can see some of the um, guidelines um, of estimate, estimated um, dimensions that we're using there to help predict that shape. For other features, um, such as the ears, you know, there's not a, lot, not a lot of information about that, but the mastoid process, just the bony lump behind your, your ear, can be useful in determining rough size and if you have earlobes or not. And in Takabuti's case, she had earlobes. Um, her lips were quite full and soft with a little bit of a cupid's bow on the top lip. So that's that little dip in the center there. Um, and we use the shape of the teeth as well as the, the height of the front teeth to help us with that prediction. For her eyes, uh, she had horizontal eye openings, so they were quite level. And we can use the um, estimated position of the inner and outer corners of the eyes to help with that. So you have um, a ligament on the outer corner and the inner corner of the eye. And where the outer corner attaches to the bone, it leaves a lump. And then on the inner corner, um, it um, flows into a little cavity, um, which we can see on the skull. So we can we can pinpoint roughly where those ligaments would have attached to tell us um, the, the um, position of the um, eye opening. So once we've predicted all of our facial features, we blend them together with the contour layer and we add a neck in and shoulders where needed um, to give us our finished reconstructed shape. And in Takabuti's case, we were asked by the research team to produce a 3D printed model that could be put on display um, at the Ulster Museum. And in order to do that, we take the 3D printed model in a uh, 3D model in free form and export it and send it off to a um, 3D printing company. The image on the top left is what the, um, the 3D printed model looks like in its original state. And onto that, we're then able to add very thin transparent layers of paint to build up a, a translucent skin layer. We're then able to add plastic eyeballs and uh, even false eyelashes. Um, and in Takabuti's case, we were asked to add um, a braided wig and some makeup um, to show how she might have looked um, in life. So that 3D printed model is on display at Ulster Museum. More recently, um, we produced um, a slightly different version of Takabuti. So we produced a 2D um, digital depiction of her, where we take a screenshot of the facial reconstruction and bring it into photo editing software. And in there, we can start to add 
skin textures. So we take samples from existing face photographs, very small samples, and add them onto the re reconstructed shape and we sh uh, reshape and morph and resize those textures to fit with the predicted shape underneath. And gradually we can start to add more and more of those until we end up with a finished textured facial depiction image. Uh, as Caroline mentioned earlier, the skull doesn't tell you any information about textural detail. So for this particular um, version of the reconstruction, we decided to produce it in a kind of grayscale sepia tone. And um, with the help of the research team, we also depicted her natural hair this time. Um, and there was information around the length and um, the slight curl in the hair as well as the colour. So that's been added into this particular um, depicted image um, rather than the braided wig. Further to that, we also produced a third version um, where uh, she has a more styled appearance. So her hair is tied up in a kind of chignon style and a little bit of um, makeup has also been added. So we now have three slightly different versions of the um, facial reconstruction of Takabuti. Um, uh, which show the different ways that she might have um, presented herself in life. <laughs>